It's so, okay. Uh, let's start for our last lecture. So this is the last recap. There won't be a recap of this lecture. <laughs> or maybe yes. Maybe at the end I I'll give a recap. Okay. So uh, the last time we we talked about the Lee Robinson bound in lattice in spin lattice systems. And we have seen that if we consider two observables, OA and OB, defining different uh, subsystems, okay, that act non trivially only in different subsystems, then you, and you consider the commutator between the time evolving operator, O of t, and the operator OB, then you find that this uh, commutator is exponentially small if, you, if the distance between the two subsystem is large, it's very large. So it is exponentially small in the distance and exponentially large in the time. So if you wait uh, sufficiently long times, then this commutator can become uh, significant, can become large. And this uh, upper bound becomes uh, completely uh, meaningless, okay? Because it becomes larger than the maximal value that uh, this uh, quantity can, uh, can assume. There is a nice corollary of this, uh, of this theorem. And uh, it is the following, that if you consider the time evolution of an observable uh, defined in a subsystem A, and you wait uh, a given time t, then you can approximate this uh, time evolving operator using a, just an operator uh, defined in another subsystem S, and provide that the this subsystem S is larger than the original uh, subsystem A, and uh, the subsystem S should, uh, should be um, sufficiently large and proportional to the time. So if you choose your accuracy hmm, of the approximation, then you can imagine that to, to consider this kind of subsystem that they grow, okay? And, uh, and you can always truncate the observed O of t, in uh, an observables that act non-trivial only on S, and uh, in such a way that the approximation is good. Okay. So we have seen this, and I want to say this is a very powerful result because it's completely general. So this is independent of the of the details of the Hamiltonian. We only assume, okay, it's assumed that the interaction should be uh, local or quasi-local. It means that uh, you shouldn't have uh, maybe Okay, no problem. Uh, I'm not sure whether this includes also Coulomb interactions, but anyway, it should decay sufficiently fast to zero, the interaction between the various sides. And, uh, uh, and we assume that the, what we assume here, this, and the fact that the, uh, the, the system has a finite dimension locally. Okay, so we are considering spin systems. You can put a, a, a spin in a, in a given site, so you have a finite, uh, uh, finite number of possible states. Mm? Okay. This is important for the, at least for the original proof of the, of the theorem. But 
but you see, it's very, very general, so we can choose our favorite amic points. Then, okay, we can see that the, we move to quench dynamics, and we consider this kind of a situation where we uh, prepare the, imagine to prepare the, the state, uh, the system in the ground state of some uh, nice Hamiltonian, like the Hamiltonian of the AC model, and then we consider the time evolution under a different Hamiltonian. So we switch on or switch off some interaction, or we, we tilt a magnetic field, or we change the, the magnetic field, or the coupling constant, whatever. And okay, in, in the case of the easy model, a simple situation is when we imagine to, to, to change the magnetic field of the, uh, the magnetic field, the, the transverse magnetic field. And uh, in this particular case, for the easy model, uh, for the easy model, what we find is that the, the state at the time t can be written in this form. And you, uh, I guess you, you have seen this in the tutorial. Uh, no, my proof of this. No. Okay, anyway, if this is what it is not difficult to prove that the, the, the state can be written in this form. So here you have the Bogolibo fermions of the final Hamiltonian. These are the, the fermion, the diagonalized H. Okay? And zero is the, uh, okay, here I forgot something. I forgot the sign. Okay, this is the sign. This is the vacuum of this uh, Vogel of fermions, of the bees, defined this way. And, uh, and then, okay, uh, we were trying to, to compute in uh, the end uh, yesterday the time evolution of the time and entropy only using the structure of the state. And we were interpreting this state as the superposition of pairs of particles mm, that are produced after the quench. And you see this pair of particles have the properties that are for, uh, if you have a particle with momentum k, there is a particle with momentum minus k. Mm -hmm. And moreover, okay, we were assuming, because okay, this is what happens, for example, in the easy model, that the, the, the ground state of the model uh, has sufficiently fast decay uh, correlations. Mm -hmm. So we can assume that uh, when uh, uh, a, a particle is produced in a given point, then only the particles that are produced very close by this point are correlated with the, the previous particle. And then, okay, in our approximation, we were just assuming that the only particle produced from the same, that are originated from the same point are, are correlated. Okay, so you, you can have, uh, so you, you, you can imagine that you have all these pairs of particles. So we know that only the particle with the momentus, momentum minus k is correlated to the particle with momentum k. This we know because of the, we have this structure of the pair, the pair structure. But now, OK, actually, these two particles could be originated from different points hmm, because there is some correlation in the initial state in the, in this, in the, in the, in the vacuum. Hmm. This correlation, as a matter of fact, is exponentially small. So what we are doing is say, okay, no, well, we can just assume that the only, if this particle uh, are originated from the same point, they are correlated. Mm -hmm. So we are saying that different pairs are completely uncorrelated, no entanglement between this pair and the other pair. And the only uh, quantum correlations are between a pair with a given, uh, a particle with a given momentum k and, the, and a particle with a, momentum minus k if they are originated from the same point. This is the physical feature. Is it okay? Hmm? So okay, can you can you see why I'm doing this? Just looking at the at the state. From this I infer immediately that the pairs are uncorrelated because the density matrix of the state is written is factorized in the pair k minus k, completely factorized. So if I, for example, compute the reduced density matrix of a, of a pair 
k minus k, I find that this describes a pure state. It's completely uncorrelated from the rest. And this, uh, uh, this accounts for the fact that they, they, they are completely independent. Then, okay, again, the, the fact that they originate from the same point depends on the initial, on the, the vacuum. We should have exponential decay correlation. Okay. So uh, this is more or less where we stop. And now we, we would like to, to compute the entanglement entropy between a subsystem and the rest in the easy mode. So, oh, I, 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 I think the psi of t, over k of cosine So the idea was this one. So we have, this is our chain, which we represent as a line. So this is, this is the position of x in the chain. Then we, we consider a subsystem A here. And this is the time in this direction. So we have all this, you should imagine all the pair originating from the initial time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the, the entanglement between A and the rest is supposed to be somehow related to, the, is given by the, is carried by the pairs uh, such that uh, one particle of the pairs is inside A and the other is outside. This is inside, this is outside, we can have also this. So in particular, this means that this particular particle uh, contribute to an, the entanglement only from this time to this time here. Yeah. Uh, like I uh, said, so this particle contribute to the entanglement from this time to this time. Because when you go, uh, if you consider time larger than this one, then you have that both particles are outside the subsystem. And uh, so well, the idea would be to, uh, that the entropy is just given by the sum of all these contribution, okay, of all these pairs. But okay, let's start from the contribution of a pair. What is the contribution of a pair of particles to the entanglement? What can be? Okay, we are using here some classic arguments, so uh, uh, you should, there is no uh, mathematical answer to my, my question, I would say. So th there is a mathematical answer, but okay, there is some physical argument behind that. And so the, the idea is that because we, uh, we are considered the, entang uh, we, the entanglement between one part and the other is essentially given by the entanglement between one particle and the other. Hmm. Okay, because one is inside, so when I say that the entanglement between the, the subsystem and the rest is carried by these particles, when one is inside, one is outside. 
So the idea is that maybe this is just given by the sum of all the entropies uh, uh, of the entanglement between uh, one particle inside and one particle outside. So what is the entanglement of one, of one particle in a pair of particles? So given a pair, we just focus on a single pair of particles, which is described by the state psi, let's focus on the particular k, psi k of t, t1, is equal to cosine of delta k over 2 plus i e to the minus 2i epsilon k t sine delta k over 2. So this is our, let's focus on this particular state. And this is the vacuum for the pair. So uh, the idea is to compute the entanglement between a particle in the state k and the particle in the state minus k, because this is what essentially what we, our physical pitch will suggest. So the idea would be to, to, so this is the state. The idea will be to compute the reduced density matrix corresponding to, it's just the vacuum of the two fermions with k minus k. So it's defined as b k zero, k minus k is equal to zero, b minus k vacuum, k minus k is equal to zero. This is the vacuum, that is the vacuum of all the particles, this is just the vacuum of the two, of these two particles, not the pair, yeah. So this is the vacuum of the pair, or I could call pair, or I pair, it's the vacuum of the pair. So we are just considering this simple problem. Instead of considering all the pairs now, because everything is completely factorized, so we can just focus on a single pair and say, what is the entanglement between one particle and the other? And then we know that we have to, to consider this contribution only when one particle is inside the subsystem and the other is outside. But that is a different problem. Now we can just compute the entanglement between one and the other particle, okay? First step. So I have this state. And uh, so in order to compute the, the entropy, I have to find the density matrix hmm, corresponding to the state K of the fermion. So I have to compute rho K. Then given rho K, I have to compute the entropy. The entropy of rho K, which is equal to minus trace of logarithm of rho K logarithm of rho k. This is what we have to do. How is this defined? Rho k, we define it as the trace over the rest of the system of the total density matrix. Our rest of the system is the state minus k. We have just two particles, k minus k. So this is, by definition, the trace over the state minus k, defined minus k, of psi t of k, psi t of k. Hmm? The definition of a reduced density matrix. The C, our system is given by the, uh, the particle with momentum k, so the rest is the momentum minus k. Corresponds. You can imagine this as uh, the site of a chain. So this is one site and this is the other site. These are the two states of our system two properties, so we, are, we are tracing over the second property, the momentum minus k. That's, that's so, just to get the, this, uh, this physical If you want, yes, you should do, but uh, this is what I was writing, was written here, that the density matrix is completely factorized when you write it. So, as a matter of fact, when you focus on a single k, a single pair, you have that the, this is described by the pure, the pure state, and this is the state because everything is factorized. So you can write this psi as the product of all these states. It's the, it's the tensor product of all these states, psi, that's right here. So this is equal to, you can prove easily that this is the, uh, the tensor product of all this psi t of k. Okay. And uh, 
So this means that we can focus on just one state and compute the entanglement between the particle in the state K and the particle in the state minus K. How can we compute this? Well, uh, either we trace, we, we should write the density matrix, okay, of the entire system, then we trace out the degrees of freedom, or otherwise we, we compute all the expectation values of the observer. It's, uh, the, the, the dimension of the, space, of the space is two, so there are no many observables. We can actually compute various expectation values. Maybe it's easier. You know? So we know that, the, so we have to compute the expectation value of uh, which operator I in the state K. And which operator can you form with, uh, with the Bogolibo fermions BK? Clearly you have BK. Okay. You can consider this. You can consider B dark K. That operator, and you can consider the operator number, B dot K, B K. And then a clear direct identity, okay. These are the four independent of the operators in our subsystem, okay. Identity, B K, B dot K, B dot K, B K. Yes, if you compute, because we want to compute the density matrix, the reduced density matrix, that you can choose your favorite way and one way is just to compute the expectation value of all this observer, then we reconstruct it because that is density matrix from that, okay. So let's see, the expectation value of the identity is clearly equal to one because it's a density matrix, so it's normalized. This is equal to one. Now we have the expectation value of BK. Hmm? <coughs> This is for the calculation, so let's try to do it in, in an efficient way. So we have to compute psi t of k b k psi t of k. This is what we want to compute. Let's call this a and this b. Okay. So we have that this is equal to uh, a vacuum plus B no, no, sorry, A, this is equal to, A, okay, A is real and B is complex, so when A star uh, vacuum plus K minus K, B, B star K minus K, with this I mean B dot K, B minus K, zero. This is the meaning of the notation, K minus K is this. So I have K minus K, and then I have BK, BK, and then I have the same here, A star, no, A, ah, okay, A zero, plus B uh, K minus K. Now, let's consider this state. You start from the vacuum. B annihilates the vacuum. So, no contribution from here. Then, we have, uh, uh, when you apply B to the state, here you add K minus K. B removes the fermion with, uh, uh, with momentum k, so you, you remain with the fermion with momentum minus k. Hmm? But now here on the left hand side you have either the vacuum or two fermions. So this is equal to zero as well. Hmm? So this means that it's equal to zero. Okay, you have all this term. B annihilates the vacuum, so no contribution from this. Now you consider the other term. When you apply B, B destroy a fermion with momentum k. In this state, you have a fermion with momentum k and one with momentum minus, minus k. When you destroy k, you remain with minus k. But now here, on the left, you have either zero fermions or two fermions. So when you consider the scalar product of the two, they are uh, orthogonal. So you find zero. The same for BDAG. Oh, no, the, 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 the same for BDAG because it can be obtained by taking the adjoint of this, the conjugate of this. So you also have that the expectation value of B dot K is equal to zero. Hmm? We are left with this. But probably we won't be different from zero. Can I, uh, can I erase this? Because we have only this part. <laughs> so. 
Okay, let's do with our work first. So we have now psi t of k, b dot k, b k, psi t of k. We have to compute this. This is equal to, again, a star 0 plus b star k minus k. Here you have b dot k, b k. And here you have a 0 plus b k minus k. Again, when you apply this to the 0, 0, because this destroys uh, the, the vacuum. When you apply this to this, what happens? This operator counts the number of fermions with uh, uh, momentum k. There is one fermion with momentum k, so this is equal to 1 when you apply to this state. How do you see this? Well, if you write, if you apply b dot k, b k to this state, using the anti commutation between k, b k and b dot k, then you find that the, this is exactly equal to itself. So what I'm saying is that this is equal to a star 0 plus b star k minus k. And here you have b, and you have k minus k. Now 0 is orthogonal to k minus k. And so finally we find that this expression value is nothing but the absolute value of b squared. So, absolute value of b squared. OK? So, let's complete this. So, we have this is equal to 0, this is equal to 0, and this is equal to the absolute value of b squared, which is sine squared of delta k over 2, which can be written as 1 minus cosine of delta k over 2. So now that we know the, the expression values, we have to write, the idea would be to write a generic density matrix of the form some coefficient times the identity plus another coefficient, uh, let's call it alpha uh, b dot k plus alpha star b k, because it should be our mission, plus gamma b dot k k, these are the independent operators, so we are just expanding the density matrix in this space. And then we, we impose that the expectation values should be these ones, and we see what we find. And we determine all the coefficients, lambda alpha and gamma. Yeah. What do we find? Well, we find that the alpha is equal to zero because of this. So we have alpha is equal to zero. Then when we impose that the trace should be equal to 1, we have the trace of the identity, which is equal to 2, because the, uh, you have two states. Either you have the spin or you don't have the spin. So you have the trace of rho is equal to lambda times 2, or equal to lambda. Then you have the trace of this operator. This operator counts the fermion. So either there, is, there are zero fermion there, uh, or there is one fermion. So the trace is equal to 1. Okay. So you have plus gamma. And this should be equal to 1. Yep. Then you have to compute the expectation values of uh, b dot bk, which is equal to 1 minus cosine delta k over 2. This should be equal to, tra to the trace of rho k b dot k bk. What do we find when we compute this trace? 
So when we multiply by this operator the identity, we find the operator itself, and you have said that the trace of this operator is equal to one. So you have that is equal to lambda. Then the, you, the, you must consider this term multiplied by these terms. And this term by this, this terms uh, is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an involution. So beta a is a projector, beta k, bk. So when you multiply it by itself, you find itself. So again, we have the trace is equal to one. So if you, you have that this one minus cosine delta over two should be equal to lambda plus gamma. We have to solve this very complicated system. And what do we find? We find that rho k is equal to one plus cosine delta k over two uh, uh, plus minus cosine delta k beta k bk, is it correct? Uh, okay, uh, this, this minus this gives lambda, one, uh, one plus, okay. And then you, you write twice this minus this, which is minus cosine, I think is correct. So this is the, the density matrix. Questions? Please ask. Uh, is there yeah, all the states. Okay, you have just one fermion. Which are the states of one fermion? One fermion, either you don't have the fermion, you are in the vacuum, or you have the fermion. You cannot have two fermions because we are, we are we have a given state, a given moment. So for the Pauli exclusion principle. So you have either zero Fermi or one Fermi. So the dimension is two of the state. And now you have to think of all the operators that you can construct with the Bogolub of fermions, with the creation operators. Now, clearly you, you cannot create more than one Fermi, so you can have just one B dag. The same, you cannot destroy more than one Fermi, so you can have just big K, but then you can also construct something like big dag B, which is the number of fermions, the operator which counts the number of fermions. Yes. It is, but it's related to this one. Because you know that B, B dag is equal to uh, one minus B dag B. So these are the independent operators. Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, he, he, he's suggesting, if I understand that, instead of doing this, so here we are using the, uh, the second, uh, um, the second way to construct the density matrix that I told you some days ago. Uh, but okay, we can also simply compute the trace over minus k. So it's suggested, because we know the states, the complete basis of states, which are either you have zero fermion. So now I can write here. So he's saying, the state is kind of simple, no? And then he's suggesting this rho k can be written as the, uh, the, the is the trace of, over minus k, so it's equal to the state with zero fermions in uh, minus k, psi t k, psi t of k, zero fermions in minus k, plus you have the fermions in, uh, in minus k, so you have minus k, minus k, psi t, 
PK, psi PK, okay, minus K, minus K. So this is what they say. And then, so you have to compute just the star product of this psi P with a state with zero fermions in minus K. And so what you find here, that uh, this contributes because you have, there is no fermion in minus K. In the other case, is that you have a fermion, so it doesn't contribute. Hmm? And so, and this is for the first term. The second term is uh, you have a fermion minus k, so this is all. This one contributes, and then you can compute and see. Yeah, it's an alternative way. Maybe it's even uh, faster. It depends whether you are more familiar with the partial traces or expectation value. I didn't consider this because you know here. Yeah, you have to consider this kind of product, star, scalar products where this is defined in a space smaller than the other. Maybe some of you are not fami very familiar with this kind of uh, okay, operation, so this is why I prefer to use expectation, to, to compute the expectation value. But that is fast, I, I agree. Okay. So we, we, we compute, if there are no mistakes, this is the density matrix of the of the density matrix correspond to, this, to the fermions uh, with momentum k. Hmm? Now the, the entropy is defined this way. So how can we compute the entropy now? Hmm? So what are you using when you say this? because the, the entropy is written as a trace, okay? So every time that you have a trace of a function of uh, a matrix, then you can write it as the sum of all the eigenvalues of the function of the eigenvalues. So we have that the S of rho k, the entropy, is equal to the sum over all the eigenvalues, one from the dimension of the space, which is equal to two here, of minus logarithm of lambda i, times lambda i, where these are the eigenvalues of rho k. Okay? This is the density matrix. So we, we have the density matrix. We have to compute the eigenvalues. In this case, the eigenvalues are very simple to compute. Why? Because this is already diagonal, this matrix, in our basis. Because the vacuum of k corresponds to this operator equal to zero. Instead, the presence of a fermion corresponds to this operator equal to one. So this is already diagonal density matrix in the basis that we chose. And the eigenvalues are, and the eigenvalues are therefore given by, there is an eigenvalues corresponding to the vacuum. Mm -hmm. Let's write just to indicate it. There is a lambda z, lambda vacuum, which is equal to one plus cosine delta k over two. And then you have the other eigenvalue, which is lambda corresponding to the presence of a, of a fermion at momentum k, which is equal to one minus cosine delta k over two. Okay, uh, if, you, if you have problems in computing uh, this kind of traces and to see that this is diagonal or whatever. You can, uh, and you are more familiar with spins. Huh? You could use a Jordan Wigner transformation to rewrite this Hamiltonian terms of spins, this Hamiltonian, this uh, density matrix. So you can rewrite everything in terms of spins, and if you prefer, so that you can understand whether it's diagonal or not and, uh, and compute the eigenvalues. This is completely equivalent. You, yeah. Okay, what I'm saying is that we have that in this space, we, um, we know a complete basis for this space, and the, the basis given by the, the vacuum of the fermion K, so no fermion, or a fermion at momentum K. This was our original basis. And my claim is that this operator here is diagonal in this base because this operator has a definite uh, value on the state with a vacuum or single fermion. So it's either zero or one. 
if it's equal to zero, then you have the eigenvalues with one plus uh, cosine. No, I, I repeating what's for other. Yes. <coughs> if uh, in the other case, one minus cosine. So we have the two eigenvalues of the of the reduced density matrix. What is the, 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 the entropy? Well, the entropy is simply given by the entropy, S of rho k, is equal to minus 1 plus cosine delta k over 2 logarithm of 1 plus cosine delta k over 2 minus 1 minus cosine delta k over 2, logarithm of 1 minus cosine of delta k over 2, which we can, we can call, for example, um, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, give me a letter. Uh, Okay, let's call this uh, G of K. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, so time. And we are just considering the, the, the state of a pair, a single pair, K minus K. And this is the entropy of a Fermi with momentum K with respect to the other. The entanglement entropy when you consider this to subsist. So is a, uh, you see, it's a different, uh, it's a different interpretation of subsystem. Because when we discuss subsystem originally, we said, okay, you have some uh, subsist, uh, some special subsystem, some part of your system, which was a physical part, and the rest. Here instead, we have a subsystem in the momentum space. So we fix the momentum. We say that the subsystem is just the particle with a given momentum. And the rest of the system are the particle with, the, with other momentum. So it's just a different, a different point of view, but the, well, uh, it, it is essentially the same, no? Okay, fine, so this is the, uh, the entropy of one particle with respect to the other. And now the idea is to is to just count all the uh, pairs that contribute to, to our entanglement between the subsystem A and the rest. So the, the, all the pairs that are such that the one particle is inside and the other is outside. And we weight this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this, uh, this cross section with, with exactly the entropy of one particle with respect to the other. So what I'm saying is that the entropy of A, the original subsystem A, with respect to this one, is given by the sum of all the entropies of the pair such that one particle is inside, the other is outside. And what is the entropy of one particle with respect to the other in the, for a single pair? This one. So we have to sum all these contributions. Is it clear? If there are questions, ask because uh, so the calculations are simple, but uh, what it's important that the, uh, the general idea is clear. Yeah. The entropy of rho k is also equal to the entropy of rho minus. We have a perfectly right. This is exactly equal to s of rho minus k because the state is pure of the pair. The state of the pair is pure. There is no entanglement between different pairs. So when you consider the reduced density matrix of a pair, it's a pure state. So you can treat it independently of the rest. And so indeed, it, this is important. Otherwise, why, how could, you, how could we, uh, could we uh, uh, quantify the entanglement between one, one particle and the other if you find different results here? So yeah, let's say. Okay, so we have this, and let's try to, to carry out the calculation, at least to, to write.
equation that we have just saw. So what is the, the equation of motion of a particle? How does it evolve? So let's assume that I have a particle here. Okay, it is produced here. And this is x and this is time. And I want to follow the thermal evolution of the particle. So what is the equation of motion of this particle? This is a fermion. It doesn't interact with anything else. And only interacting fermions, which, are, which is working. Okay. And at a given velocity. So we have just to compute the velocity of the particle. And then this is just a, 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 linear, a linear trajectory. Okay, we follow. So what is the velocity of the particle? We know the dispersion relation of the Bogolubo fermion. So we computed the dispersion relation. The velocity of the particle is the derivative of the dispersion relation with respect to the momentum. Is this clear? This should be clear. If you want, in, in classical physics, if you write the, uh, uh, the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian equation, when you compute Q x dot, is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum. Yeah. There it is. OK? So this should be a, a clear equation. So we have, this is the velocity of the particle with momentum k. And then we have to follow the time evolution. So again, we have to count the particle inside and outside. What we have to do in practice? So we have to, first of all, the, the pair can be everywhere in our chain. So we have to integrate over all the position, the x from minus infinity to infinity hmm, of the pair where, where the pair is originated. Then, at the time t, the particle is at the, uh, the particle is at x plus v of k t, right? This is the x of t. The position of the particle at the time t is the position at the initial time, which I call x here, yeah? plus v t. Okay. What is the position of the of the other particle of the pair? It will be, oh, this is uh, uh, x k. Now we have x minus k of t, which is equal x plus t minus k. Mm -hmm. But in the particular case of the easy model, we have that the, the velocity is not the function of k, mm -hmm. because epsilon is even. So you have that this is equal to x plus minus sorry, v of k t. So this is the. <clears throat> this is the uh, equation of motion of the other particle. Then we want the one particle should be inside, the subsystem and the other, no. So we have to put some delta function here. Uh, yes, oh, that's delta function, okay. Let's write a, a theta function, a characteristic function, where one particle, x plus v of k t, should belong to our subsystem A. Hmm? This is, I'm just using this uh, weird notation. Now it is, it's not a mathematical notation. I'm writing what I'm telling you. So the particle uh, at the time t is in our subsystem A, and the other particle should be outside. Okay? So here, I have to multiply by the other particle, x minus v of k of t times t, that shouldn't belong to A. The theta is the characteristic function. No, this is not probability. Hmm? Yeah. Then I have to integrate over all the contribution from the pair. The contribution from the pair, so yeah, I have to integrate over all the momenta. And I have to put the contribution of the single pair, which is this one. So you have this expression times g of k.
okay, I, in the X, because I, I have to consider that the pair can be produced everywhere, hmm? but then I want, the only condition that I have to satisfy is that they can be everywhere, but when the, I consider the time t, at the time t, there should be one particle inside the subsystem, which is this one, but the, 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 the mate should be outside of the particle. My initial state is just the, this superposition of a pair everywhere. You have pairs originating everywhere in your system. Yes, any time moment. You have a, because okay, it's written here. You have every time, every moment here. Yeah. You can have a, every k. In each point, because indeed uh, this is a translation invariant state, so there is no uh, privileged point. So each point is equivalent to the other. So physically, the idea is that these pairs are produced everywhere in this picture. Hmm? Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Because this is the structure of the state. So we can always. Uh, This is exactly the initial state corresponding to a quantum quantity in the easy model. When you change the magnetic field, the initial state is, is written in this way. So this is why, this is actually our problem, which is very complicated. I, I want to stress that if you try to compute this kind of quantity uh, analytically, it's very complicated. And uh, uh, I, I did it uh, uh, 10 years ago, but uh, it, it's not simple. But uh, anyway, you find exactly the same, the, the exact, the, the, you obtain the exact solution if you use just this semi classical feature. So, uh, uh, ah, this one? Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Theta of x in A is equal to 1 if x is in A, is equal to 0 if x is not in A. Oh, Yes, it's there, it's there. Okay. And now we have, indeed, okay, it was just an informal way to write this. Now we have to, to write it explicitly. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, this is the entropy of A. This is the, okay, now I can... This is the entropy of the subsystem A at the time t. Okay. Now we can define what is the subsystem A. Correct, no? Uh, all the time. I need to go over what time. Okay, now the, the subsystem A can be, for example, the, the, the spins from zero to L. Everything is invariant under the translation, so this is arbitrary for amber. So we can just say zero to L. And so what does it mean, this theta function? This theta function means that the x plus V of K T should be between zero and L. Okay. And, uh, but we have also this other condition. So the other condition is that X minus V of K T should be between zero and L. Okay. So what does it mean? This means that this means that x minus uh, uh, sorry sorry what I wrote here uh, should be larger okay no this other condition means that it should be either larger than l or smaller than zero.
Okay. And so we have to solve this problem now. How to write this integral. Okay. I give you five, four minutes, and then we do it. Okay. Yes. Why to execute this uh, this calculation? So, so we have to compute this integral when we have this condition. So that the position x plus vt should be in uh, inside a, which means that they should be between zero and l, and instead the x minus vt should be larger than l or smaller than zero. Okay. We have to fulfill all these conditions in our integration so so we have uh, to find the correct domain the do, minimum of integration domain of integration sorry okay so hey so you are if you are not interested you can just go outside and it's, a, it's your choice so from this relation we have that x plus v x plus vt is more than L. So this means that the x should be smaller than L minus vt, right? So x should be smaller than L minus v of k t. This. From this relation, we also have that x should be larger than minus vt. From this. But now we have also to impose these other conditions. This condition means that x should be smaller than vt. Should be also smaller than vt, so we must remember here, no? And what this, this means that it should be smaller than the minimum between the two. Not v of k t. From this condition, we have that x should be larger than l can be uh, should be larger than l plus v of k t. And so this means that should be larger than the maximum between this and this. You are perfectly right. Okay, you're right. Uh, so we first had to write this. Okay, yes. Mm. You're right. Okay, this is an end, and then we have an end with one of the two. Okay, sorry, indeed, it was kind of weird. This. Okay. So we have this, and we have either. We have that x should be smaller than v uh, of kt. So it should be this. Mm. But then, uh, OK, what do you see? OK, you have this. Or what you have, the other condition is that it should be larger than L plus Vt. So we have the same maximum, 
minus b of k t and l plus b of k t and here you have l minus b of k t but clearly this should be larger than this because it was an end condition so this means that this is possible only if v of kt is larger than minus v of kt. Okay? So indeed, this is possible if theta, if there is a theta of v of k, it should be max, uh, larger than the, the minus itself, so it should be positive, v of k. Hmm? Tell me if uh, there is something wrong, eh? just for that sake. Uh, and here, instead, you have uh, the L minus V of KT should be larger than L plus V of KT. So again, it means that now minus V should be larger than V. So it should be negative. So here you have plus theta minus V. Okay. So, uh, and here you have all the integral in BK and so on, and the function g of k here. Hmm? Uh, I think we can simplify this expression. Now, if, uh, mm, how do we simplify this expression? Uh, well, let's start putting some absolute values, just because I know the result. So you have that there. because here you have a theta of v, then v is equal to its absolute value. Mm. I can write this. Now v here is negative, so v is equal to minus its absolute value. I have to change the sign. Okay, so here there is an integral in dk over 2 pi or minus pi to pi. Mm -hmm. Okay, of g of k. Now uh, the integral over x of this, of this domain, is equal to this minus this. There is no dependence on x in the integral. So we can carry out the integral. So this is equal to integral minus pi to pi in dk over 2 pi theta of v of k. Then you have this minus this. L minus v of k t v of k plus v of k v of k t mm? then we have the other part which is theta and there is a g g of k plus theta of minus v of k and here you have l plus v of k t minus the maximum between v of k t and l minus v of k t. Now the minimum of this plus this is the minimum of this plus this plus uh, and this plus this. Mi minimum. Minimum. The minimum between a and b plus c is equal to the minimum between a plus c and b plus c. Okay. So I can, um, can plug this inside the minimum. So you have, I can simplify this. And here I get a factor of 2. Go here. Then minus the maximum is equal to mi the minimum between minus minus the maximum 
between A and B is equal to the minimum between minus A and minus B. So here I can plug the minus sign inside and transform the maximum into a minimum. So here it becomes plus minimum, yeah, minus, minus plus. So now you have L plus V minus V. So, so if I write everything now, it becomes equal to the integral decay over 2 pi theta of V of K. Then here we have, uh, we, we have the, the minimum between L and 2 V of K T. There is a G of K, I'm saying. Plus minus V of K. Now here we have the, <coughs> the minimum between L plus V minus L, which is L, and L plus V minus L plus V, which is 2 V of K T. G of K. Who? Look, this is exactly equal to this one. So this is so we find the integral decay over two pi. Theta v plus theta minus v is equal to one. Hmm? Okay, because v is either positive or negative. So minimum between L and two v of k t, and we have this function g of k that we computed before. This is amazing because we compute something extremely complicated. You, you don't realize it, but uh, we <laughs> So we found this very simple result for the entanglement between a subsystem of a length L and the rest in the easy model. Okay, and what is the behavior? If I now, if I plot this punch, what do I find? Now what's should be here. Uh, yes, minimum. Yes, it's right. Okay. What do I find now? Let's let's plot the. This is the entropy of the subsystem A at the time t. This is the time. So, at time equal to zero, the minimum between these two numbers is zero. So it means that the entropy is we find zero. Okay. Well, this is just a sponge. Then what happens when you increase the time? You, you, you increase the time. So you have to consider the minimum between the L, the subsystem length, and something which is multiplied by a small number. Now the velocity, you remember, is bounded in the easy model or in, the, in spin chains. You know that there is a Libra Robinson velocity, no? which is the maximum velocity that you can have in the spin chain. So this means that as long as the time is not enough for the maximal velocity to, to be such that L equal to Vt, then you have that the behavior is just linear in, in the time. You have that the minimum of this is always equal to 2 Vt. So what you find is that there is a linear increase, exactly linear increase, up to which time? Up to the time equal to Tf is equal to L divided by twice the maximal velocity. So here our prediction is an exact linear slope, but then what happens, then when you increase the time, then there will be momenta for which this, uh, this is still uh, smaller than L, and there will be momenta in which instead you have the opposite relation. So what happens is that this will start curving like this, and what happens when, you, when, you, uh, when the time approaches infinity? When the time approaches infinity, it means that you have, the, you have to compute the minimum between L and the velocity multiplied by an extremely large number. 
So this can be, uh, this number can be smaller than this only is if the velocity is close to zero. So it just, uh, uh, you, you just get a very small contribution because we are integrating over this region. So this is, a, and in the end you don't see anymore the contribution from this uh, 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 low energy modes. And you only find this term. So in the end, at, at infinite time, what you find is that, okay, this is, as, uh, okay, this is the entropy. What you find is that it approaches L integral in the k over 2 pi of g of k. Yeah, let's assume that the time is equal uh, uh, one million and the maximum velocity is equal to one. Okay. And then you have that, uh, and so your, the velocity is something like this. Uh, um, it's something like this. It's the velocity as a, as a function of k. Okay. Now, the momenta for which, uh, for large time, this becomes. Uh, larger, uh, this is, uh, yes, larger than this, are confined around here and around here. So you are restricting this region, increasing the time. This region becomes smaller and smaller. And so the integral over this region becomes smaller and smaller, and in the end they don't contribute anymore. And so you have always the opposite situation where the, this term is larger than this one, and so because there is a minimum here, you, you always pick L. So this is the qualitative behavior of the curve, not the, of the entropy. And what you find that the, uh, if you do the calculation exactly, you find that the, this is exactly what you get when you, go, when you start the limit, L goes to infinity of the entropy of A divided by L. Let's write this. So what I mean uh, here. So if you study this kind of this limit, so you divide this expression by L, if you want. Hmm? So you see that this becomes a function of T over L. Now if you take the limit of large subsystem at, uh, at given ratio T over L, you fix T over L, and you take the limit of large subsystem, which also means large times, then you obtain analytically this expression. So this is the exact result. So we obtain this result in a semi-classical way, and we obtain the exact result, the asymptotic behavior. Why, uh, 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 why this is semi-classical, this approach? Essentially, it's because our particles have a given position and momentum. So we are following the trajectory of this particle. I say, OK, at the given time, the particle is here. Quantum mechanical, this is impossible, OK? Because it's, uh, you have the uh, Heisenberg uh, uh, indetermination principle. OK, so this is a semi-classical calculation. Nevertheless, we obtain the, the correct result. And then uh, finally, what is interesting here is that the Semi-classical because when we, uh, in order to obtain this uh, uh, these results, we uh, we follow the time evolution, the trajectory of the particles, but the trajectory is defined only for classical particles. Okay. And it's, it's it's not classical but semi-classical because we started from a quantum model and uh, we obtained the, the correct dispersion relation. We we checked that the, the state is factorized, so we, we didn't start from. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what <clears throat> do we see from here? One interesting part of this result is that we, we see that at sufficient large time, 
the entry becomes independent of the time. Okay. So you see that the approach is a stationary value. And this is an example of what I was telling you yesterday, that when you consider the expectation values of observables after a quantum quench, then uh, in the thermodynamic limit, uh, the limit of infinite time exists. Mm -hmm. So you don't have this kind of uh, quasi-periodicity. You know, the, the limit exists, and, uh, and, and all these observables behave in some stationary way. Uh, moreover, as you can see from here, the entropy of the subsystems in this limit, in limit of large time, becomes, it becomes extensive, proportional to the subsystem length. We should remind you what happens in statistical physics hmm? when you have a finite temperature or whatever. So just from this picture, well, you can imagine there is some hope that we can describe the system at large time using some kind of statistical, uh, statistical, statistical, statistical way. For example, introducing some uh, statistical ensemble. Okay, and this was, this is what we uh, we we have done in the past. Okay, but uh, it's, uh, it's clearly late for any calculation of this kind. And uh, uh, so let's see. Mm. I just give you the the general picture, and. Uh, Maybe if you're interested, I tell you very briefly, just a matter of two minutes, how can you, how can you do this kind, how can you uh, see in the easy model that uh, indeed the limit of infinite time exists? Because it's just uh, three, two minutes, what you have to do. So, okay, well, I told you that the, a, a, in order to compute the expectation values of observables, you can rely on the Wicks theorem. Wicks theorem means that you just need to compute the expectation values of the Majorana fermions. Right? Now you are interested in the time evolution of the Majorana fermions, so you actually compute the expectation value of the Majorana fermions at the time t. I told you. I, I, I wrote the relation between the Majorana fermions and the Bogolibov fermions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you have to compute is this kind of correlations. You, in the end, you find the relations like this, like this one, for example, two L minus one of t, two N minus one of t is equal to delta L n uh, plus uh, one over n sum over uh, J, uh, sum over K, sorry, of uh, E to the minus I L minus N K sine delta K sine of epsilon K T. You obtain expression like this when you complete the calculation. Then you, when you take the thermodynamic limit, again, the sum becomes an integral. So you have delta N plus the integral over decay over 2 pi of the same expression. Now, you see that this is an oscillatory function. Use the riemann lebesgue lemma. And so in order to, to prove that this integral and the limit of large times become uh, approaches zero. And you find the same also for the other correlations. So you always find terms. <coughs> You, you find terms that survive the thermodynamic limit, uh, that survive the infinite time limit, and you find terms that oscillate, and so you have to cancel them. And you prove, indeed, that the, the limit exists for this. Is, this is the riemann level, the fact that this limit exists, limit of infinite time. This is, uh, okay, I, I, I will not repeat this. Okay. Yeah, first I consider the limit n goes to infinity, and then the limit t goes to infinity, in order to simplify the term. Okay, this is the, just to show that, that there is relaxation in, the, in, this, in this model. Okay, uh, what is the general picture? Indeed, okay, just a moment now. Here, it, it simply means that we are relaxing. Okay, the, all the expectation values are relaxed to some, uh, to some, some values right, that we don't know. And then the question becomes, how can we characterize these expectation values? 
and the and the picture is uh, is the following. So in order to characterize the the uh, expected behavior of the state at very large times, you don't need to know everything. Okay, all the expectation bars, all the time evolution. You just need to know the expectation values of the conservation laws. So the quantities that are conserved. So if uh, in your system there is a quantity that is conserved, it means that the, its expectation values is the same at any time, no? Because if you consider, let's assume that you find a quantity Q that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Now let's consider the time evolution of the expectation values of this quantity. Q e to the minus iht psi zero. Because this commute with Q, then this is equal to psi zero, Q psi zero. So without doubt, you, you, you know the expectation values of these quantities at any time. Hmm? They, it is just given by the expectation value at the initial time. And, and this gives you a constraint to your dynamics. Because you know that whatever the, the final, uh, whatever description we'll find at infinite time, it should be compatible with all these constraints. Okay? Then, okay, I, let's just imagine that we are in a generic situation. Let's imagine that the Hamiltonian is completely generic, no symmetries. There are no symmetries in the Hamiltonian, so if there are no symmetries, you, you don't expect the existence of these conserved quantities. No? So, you, you can just say, okay, the energy is conserved. That is true, because we consider an isolated system. So H is conserved. So H is conserved, and this is a, so we have the derivative with respect to the time of the expectation value of H is equal to zero. Okay, fine. But okay, we, ca we can't find all these other quantities. So the idea is that but when, we, uh, when we are considered the limit of infinite time, we are somehow losing some information about our system. For example, we are losing the information that could allow us to go back in time. Because we are replacing, for example, all this curve, which is a kind of complicated curve, with just a line, just a value, the asymptotic value. So we are not able to go back anymore. And so the, the picture is that, well, the, uh, as a matter of fact, the time evolution uh, is, uh, uh, is making us lose all the information about the system. And the only thing that we, we know is this one, is, is given by the constraints to the dynamics, given by the conservation laws. So in this case of a generic system, the constraint is the energy. And uh, what the, which is the quantity that measures the information of the system is the entropy. So uh, the, the conjecture, it was a conjecture, is that uh, you can describe the stationary values at infinite time after this kind of quantum quenches by replacing the state. So here we are considering the time evolving state psi t. And now I'm saying, I, because I'm interested in the limit of large times, so I can replace the state by a density matrix rho. And how, how do I define the density matrix? The density matrix is that operator that maximizes the entanglement, and the, the entropy, sorry, not the entanglement. So this is maximum. But you have, you, you have to follow all the constraints. You have to impose all the constraints. So in particular, you have that the energy should be conserved. So the trace such that, su such that, such that the trace of rho h should be equal to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in the generic case. But this is nothing but the thermal state, the Gibbs distribution, Boltzmann distribution. Because this is how you obtain, for example, the canonical distribution. You maximize the entropy and you fix the energy. When you do this, you can, uh, for example, use a, a, um, a variational approach. Anyway, what you, what you find when you impose this is that rho, this implies that rho is equal to some constant times e to the minus beta h, where beta is a parameter. Generally, beta is the inverse temperature. Now, beta is a parameter which is fixed by this condition. And this is what we call thermalization in closed systems. 
So we, we, start, we, we are in an isolated system. We focus on a part of the system because we are in the thermodynamic limit. And we are saying that I can, I can, um, I can replace my complicated, extremely complicated time evolving state by a simpler density matrix, which is essentially the density matrix of the canonical ensemble in the generic, in the generic case. Uh, this is not, uh, uh, okay, this holds when there are no symmetries in the Hamiltonian. Let's assume now that you have uh, a symmetry like the a rotational symmetry for a spin chain. For example, let's assume that the, what happens if sum over L of a, a sigma LZ is conserved. Or the number of operators, if you have the number of uh, particles conserved. Then you have to do the same as you did in, uh, uh, in your course of statistical physics. You have to impose all the other constraints here. And for example, here you find something which is the canonical, uh, the grand canonical ensemble. So if you have particle numbers conserved, so you can expect oh, no, that is this. an expression like this, grand canonical. Now, okay, and uh, well, and you can compute this uh, uh, using this variation. You know how to obtain this or not. Okay, generally when you want to maximize a function given some constraint, you, you introduce Lagrange multipliers. Hmm? Okay, well, uh, I, I don't want to enter into the details, but this is what you find. What happens if you now have more constraints? Yeah, you have to, to put, you, you, you see immediately that you have to include here all the conserved quantities of the Hamiltonian. And uh, are there cases when you have more conserved quantities than, for example, the Hamiltonian, the particle number, the angular momentum, or the momentum? Are there? Well, if you read the Landau uh, Lipschitz, then in the first page they said, okay, the integral of motion are just uh, seven of them. So the three angular momentum, then the energy, then the momentum, okay? But this is for generic systems. If you consider a very special system like easing, you can have many more conservation laws. As a matter of fact, in the so-called the integrable systems, like the easing, you have infinitely many conservation laws. So it means that here you have to place infinitely many operators. And instead of considering just a thermal ensemble, you have to work with something which, is, which has this form, the exponential of minus sum over j up to infinity of lambda j qj. So when you have infinitely many uh, operator here, this is called generalized Gibbs ensemble. Yeah. So it's a Gibbs ensemble uh, uh, as far as we have just a finite number of conservation laws called Gibbs. If instead you have to deal with infinitely many operators, then this is called generalized Gibbs ensemble. Okay. I think that uh, we are done and uh, I'm happy that the, the last words that I said are generalized Gibbs ensemble to us. <laughs> so, well, other questions? And this was a conjecture. And uh, the idea is that when you consider the uh, expectation values of observables, that you have all the, uh, when you expand in the basis of the Hamiltonian, you have all the phases, no? And you expect that there is this kind of defacing mechanism where all these phases in the end simplify like in this case, okay? And then this means that actually you are losing all, all information about the system, but the, 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 the part which is, uh, which is clear, clearly, you should be clearly satisfied from the time equal to zero. Okay, if you want something else, I can tell you that uh, because you are interested in the limit of infinite time, instead of considering the infinite time limit, you could consider just the time average. Although here there are problems of limits, but anyway, if you consider the time average, then you find that you can describe everything you see the diagonal sum. And then you have the ET, if you apply ETH, and so on. Right? 